can see that. Okay. <clears throat> so Sandeep, do you want to open the, the meeting and just... Uh, yeah. I think people are still logging in and still one more minute left, so we'll just wait for a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Nikola, I hope Bulgaria is not getting affected by this war, right? Well, so also... there is a there is a big sea um, in across, in just in between. But um, uh, a lot of people like to exercise that in that sea. So hopefully not. Hopefully not. Hopefully will be will be over soon. That's what we can hope the best. It's not great situation. <clears throat> So I think it's about time. So I, <clears throat> so I welcome everybody for our fifth edition of How I Do It uh, series, which we have been doing for last one and a half years. And this time we are doing it, uh, the World Spinal Column Society is doing along with World Federation of Neurosurgery and ENS. And first speaker would be Dr. Shivani Hep from, yeah, you are representing uh, ENS, right? Yes, yes. Yes, we have two representation, the representation from two um, speakers today. One is uh, Shiban and the other one is Anjay. So we are happy to have you guys on board. Okay, so okay. Shiban, up to you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to represent the European Association of Neurosurgery. My talk is about surgical planning and Sagittal balance. Um, I'm a neurosurgeon working from Augsburg, Germany. It's an academic hospital uh, near Munich, if you guys know it. So basically, these are my disclosures. Have, don't really have an impact on uh, the um, talk. So I would like to go through the analysis of sagittal balance in an easy way, not very complicated, how you can teach your residents to do it uh, without too many fa fancy computers. And then when you measure it, if you see the patient is balanced, how to measure and how to need to perform the needed correction. And a few slides at the end, we'll talk about why we need to know uh, the subject balance in, in most cases. So you all know that by now you need a whole spine imaging. You need to see the uh, tip, you know, octopus cervical junction down to the femur heads. Many of the orthopedic colleagues are now promoting, looking at the knee and the, I think it's to, uh, uh, too much for day-to-day -day practice. So basically, long-standing AP and lateral uh, from C0 uh, to the femur heads is sufficient. First of all, you look at the SVA, cycle vertical axis, this uh, red, uh, the green line you see here, this is the plumb line from C7. And as long as it is between the uh, sacrum and the femur heads, basically the patient is balanced. If it's more than four or five centimeters, then the patient is in balance. These are the things you read about uh, too many times, sacral slope, pelvic incidence, and pelvic tilt. The only thing that you need to know here is that the pelvic incidence is the most important thing. Uh, it's like a, foot, a fingerprint. I just saw this uh, analysis yesterday from a very good colleague from Turkey. Very nice uh, talk about cycle balance. He said also pelvic incidence is like fingerprint. It's like your DNA. You are born with it. It doesn't change in time. And this basically determines how much lumbar lordosis you need. Here, another illustration showing you that this is an anatomic constant. It's not affected by the patient's positioning. The sacrum will move with the pelvis so that this angle will stay the same every, all the time. And you are born with this angle and it doesn't change. Basically, if you have a low pelvic incidence, you need a low lumbar lordosis to stay harmonic in the spine. If you have a high pelvic incidence, you see here that you need a higher lumbar lordosis again to stay harmonic and upright. 
that the key parameters are SPA less than five and pelvic incidence to lumbar doses mismatch shouldn't be more than 10 degrees. What does mean? Pelvic incidence, again, is a constant. You are born with it. This determines how much low doses you need. And if the relation is off by more than 10 degrees, then uh, something's wrong. So in the degenerative spine with aging, you have multiple uh, things happen. Type one uh, changes are you know, hyperpressure of the lumbar spine, you lose low doses and the other compensating mechanisms you have to hyperextend and you also lose um, the stability and get, um, for example, spondylolisthesis. So here with age, this is from the hook himself, you know, the founder of Psychobalance from France, showing us that in time, the pelvic will tilt up uh, ventrally, the pelvic tilt, trying to compensate for the changes happening in the lumbar doses. And if you look at it in a systematic way, you, you do have compensatory mechanisms starting with the spine. The patient will um, try to maintain cyclical balance, will have a lumbar uh, hyperlordosis. The thoracic kyphosis reduces. You have retrovistasis hyperextension in the lumbar spine. The pelvic tilts uh, forward to enable for more lumbar lordosis. And here again, uh, changes in the knee and the ankle, but this takes it too far in my opinion. So we have this paper from uh, 15 years back now, looking at normal individuals for whole standing x-ray. They basically found that most of the people are have uh, a definitive category of pelvic incidents. So they build these six group of pelvic incidents where are, these are all normal variants. And according to your pelvic incidence, you will have a theoretical lumbar doses you should have. So for example, if you have a pelvic incidence of 50, you should have a lumbar low doses of 60. And if this is not you know, um, corresponding, then something is off. So how to analyze cycle balance in daily practice for a resident to know, first of all, look at the SVA is the green line between the sacrum and the femur heads. If not, the patient is in imbalance. Look for compensatory mechanism, mainly for the lumbar spine, because most of the time we only have lumbar x-rays. Look for listesis, look for uh, uh, any kind of compensatory mechanisms, and look at the pelvic incidence and uh, know how much lumbar low doses this patient should have. And if he doesn't have that, then you have the mismatch and you can even calculate how much you need. So again, SVA uh, is he, between the sacrum and the femur head, is he balanced? We have a patients that are compensated but balanced, and these are patients that are unbalanced. Again, pelvic instance 50, actual lumbar low doses should be 60, and then you have a mismatch of 30 degrees. How to get these 30 degrees? Um, you can calculate that with surgery map, how many osteotomies, and what to do exactly, how many levels. I'll show you also artificial intelligence data coming out now from Medtronic. But basically the only thing we really can do is bend the patient towards the rod. And you can bend the patient uh, only if you do sufficient compression without harming the patient. So depending on how many degrees you need, you can go away with different kinds of osteotomies. Penty osteotomies are least extensive one, only removing the facets. With smith Pedersen, you go into the a disc space, particular osteotomy is also very highly morbid, but you can get up to 30 degrees and vertebral polymerization obviously even more. You can also combine more than one osteotomy type and more than one level to get your optimal correction degree. And basically at the end of surgery, you will bend the rod with your hand and try to put the patient into your bended rod. The second rule of thumb is that two thirds of the lumbar doses should be at the lower parts between L4 and S1. This you need to be calculating with your uh, correction measures. So how to measure during surgery? This is very difficult. You know, the patient is prone, he's decompressed. You really are bending your rod with your hand. I really like this from Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the head. Planning for degenerative scoliosis is sometimes very hard to do. So now we have like an app, you can do an, uh, a picture with your cell phone at the end of surgery after you put the rods in, then this could help you if you, to tell you if you reach your needed direction. 
but there's also more fancy ways where you can um, bend the rod with a computer, you know, from an eraser to Bendini, um, which is also very nice if you have it. But now we have this uh, artificial intelligence coming on. This is from Metronic, they bought this company. They're still uh, starting with it now, but as I'm told, they already have 8,000 cases already in the US put in this um, algorithm. So you send them the x-rays, the computer will calculate how much correction you need according to the cycle balance, but they also will balance age, gender, weight, and height. And then the artificial intelligence will plan the new alignment with the new construct, but also the compensating mechanisms of the thoracic spine, which is very hard for us to do, you know, without uh, this artificial intelligence software. This could predict the movement of the thoracic spine and even the cervical spine according to your um, spinopelvic correction methods. And then they even give you more than one plan. You get three alternative plans at least. You can you know, tell them what you need depending on how surgery is going and depending on what the mobility of the patient, either you do one, two or multi-level combinations of osteotomies with or without intervary fusion. And then you can order a patient-specific pre-bent rod. And then when you are in surgery, you just don't touch the rod anymore. You don't bend it anymore. Just try to put the patient in the rod after performing the planned surgery. And why do we need to know that? Because it correlates with mechanical complications. You know, first the first studies about cycle balance, they all told us that some degrees or some um, cycle slope should correlate with uh, quality of life, well, it doesn't. It does correlate with mechanical complications and not so much clinical outcome. This is one of the studies looking at exactly that. I would like to make a long, short, long story short. You look here, the patients that are aligned with regards to relative lumbar load doses, they don't have, they have mechanical complications in 12% of cases. If they are severely malaligned, the complication rate will go up to 8 to 5%. The gap score was uh, introduced to us by the colleagues for the deformity group 2017. They are looking at different aspects of sexual balance in the relative pelvic uh, tilt, the relative lumbar load doses, low dose distribution, global sexual balance, and age. And they found, or they built the score, they, you add up uh, multiple aspects of the score and you get a, a, a number. Everything more than seven is severely disproportionate. And here you see the area under the curve is more than 90%. So they could predict mechanical complication in more than 90% of cases um, if they were severely disproportionate. One issue about cycle balance, some people still don't believe it's true, is that it hasn't been validated in too, too many other cohorts. This is one of the studies published in 2019, trying to use the gap score to predict mechanical failure here in 150 patients, but they were unable to do so. Here you see the area under curve is 50. So basically you were throwing a coin and then deciding if a patient will have mechanical complication or not, depending on the CAP score. So in summary, cycle balance is important in spine surgery. If you are doing instrumentation, um, you need to know about cycle balance, but don't attempt to achieve that in all cases because it's highly morbid and you can get up and get into a high rate of complication. That's it. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much. It was a uh, very informative and very good uh, talk. And thank you so much for taking the effort, being at the airport and being with us. Uh, I you. hope you will have a safe flight. Thank uh, you very much. Maybe one, maybe one comment uh, just uh, as we have you here and you will not be with us. Uh, with regards of uh, getting the knees in the picture, Maybe a simple thing would be you can just put the patient supine and you see if they can extend enough their, their hip and their knees. And uh, that is something that probably will be helpful to say, okay, uh, if I correct, the patient will be still okay. Because if they cannot extend the hip and knee, then maybe your correction will not be, will be affected as well. Maybe that's just my comment. I think so. Yes, you're right. But I think this makes, uh, makes it more complicated for us spine surgeons on daily practice also to look at the knee and the hip, which we don't really understand, at least as neurosurgeons. So maybe we need more help. No, I, I don't understand hip and knee. What I can see is just if they can uh, extend the, the hip and knee enough so they can, uh, if, if there is a lot of degeneration and hip and knee and they cannot extend it, then obviously 
you have to factor that in your in your correction. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so I hope you are. Um, I, I guess you are now in a hurry, and we'll let you go, and uh, we'll uh, go with the with the next speaker. Um, Sandeep, do you want to present? Uh, yeah. So next speaker is Dr. Mehmet Zileli, who's from Turkey, and everybody knows him. But I don't really need to introduce him. So he will be talking on the posterior techniques of uh, correction. So Mehmet, you can share your screen now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Thanks a lot for a uh, nice invitation. Uh, and first of all, before starting, I wish a quick peace uh, at the U Ukrainian region. And then uh, I uh, wish all the best for our colleagues living in Ukraine. Uh, now I will talk about posture correction techniques, uh, the most common used ones. Uh, the osteotomy is main indication of osteotomy is a fixed kyphosis associated with or without uh, pain or pseudoarthrosis. Actually, uh, if it's a flexible kyphosis, we can uh, make uh, some reduction without an osteotomy. Uh, the, Schwab's classification, which was published uh, in 2015 in neurosurgery, uh, has uh, s cleared some uh, uh, areas in uh, osteotomy techniques. Actually, it is more a uh, anatomic classification uh, with grading from one to six. Uh, and if you look at the details, Grade 1 is a partial facet joint resection. Grade 2 is complete facet joint resection. Grade 3 is a pedicle and partial body resection. Grade 4 is pedicle, partial body and disc resection. 5 is complete vertebra, vertebra and disc resection. And grade 6 is a, a multiple adjacent vertebra uh, and disc res resection. Actually, Another thing, the old terminology, the Smith-Peterson osteotomy, Ponte osteotomy, and uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy are can be uh, accepted as the grade one, two, and three, as you can see on the lower corner of my slide. Uh, uh, for uh, you about using a cage ventrally. Uh, actually, grade 1, 2, and 3 do does not need any uh, cage. However, if you resect whole vertebra together with the, uh, with the disc or uh, whole vertebra, grade 4, 5, and 6, then you need a vertebral body cage uh, ventrally. If you look at the normal spine, these are uh, some uh, illustrations to understand it better. Type 1 is a partial facet resection, as I depicted here. Type 2 is a complete facet resection. Type 3, three as we know, uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy, pedicle and partial body resection. These are type 4, 5, 6, uh, which will be uh, mentioned uh, after my talk. Actually, Smith-Peterson osteotomy is the pioneer of the osteotomies, probably. It was first described by Smith and Peterson uh, in 1960s, and, and it was uh, removing the, par the facet joints partially, and making a anterior opening. Actually, the disc uh, ventrally was opening. And each level, uh, you, you are able to provide 5 to 15 degree correction. These are some pictures. Uh, as I said before, uh, 
went through the disc ruptures. Actually, uh, the the first patients which the, this osteotomy was used was ankylosing spondylitis, and since they had a smooth angled uh, thoracic kyphosis mostly, and if uh, the surgeons were doing multiple levels smith Peterson osteotomies by opening ventrally they had some cases the aorta has ruptured so then and uh, there was a tendency to leave that type of osteotomy afterwards these are some other pictures from an atlas of uh, osteotomy as you can see the, these are the anterior syndesmophytes are broken it, it, is, it can be provided by uh, po uh, by uh, closing the posterior screws or uh, by um, uh, table deflection these are some uh, pictures uh, yes you can uh, apply uh, a compression force on the heads of the screws uh, on the rod so then uh, you you then uh, uh, reduce the uh, kyphosis at each level approximately 10 degree yes what about ponte osteotomy ponte is an italian uh, orthopedic spine surgeon He's alive, uh, and he's, uh, he has described similar osteotomy, but with total facet resections and without any anterior opening. Those posterior closing uh, uh, can reduce 10 degree in each level. It's very similar to Smith Patterson. But uh, there is some uh, differences, slight mild differences. Pedicle subtraction osteotomy uh, can uh, provide 30 to 35 degree reduction. Uh, then uh, in that osteotomy, uh, you can uh, you should remove uh, transverse uh, transverse processes, all the facet joints, lamina, spinous process, and uh, one third of the uh, posterior part of the vertebral body the anterior part uh, you can go till uh, ALL however you must uh, not go further and uh, you will not uh, open up uh, ventrally it is safer at L1 or below blood loss may, uh, can be uh, very high actually uh, because of uh, the work on the floor of the canal, epidural veins may bleed a lot. Uh, it should better be done at the apex of uh, the kyphosis. Uh, shortens posterior and middle column, hinges on anterior column. Should open up, enlarge the canal centrally, and dural kinking must be avoided. Actually, this is a very, very important point. In case of a stenotic central canal, a wide posterior column decompression should be performed centrally and closing forces uh, should be applied in cantilever and compression uh, modes. Uh, this is some stages. Uh, again, our illustrator has uh, 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 drawn uh, then you can provide a significant lordosis with that technique. In fact, there was so-called eggshell approach, which was used many years before uh, by the or, uh, by some spine surgeons. Uh, actually, uh, at that time there was no drills, uh, ICP drills that, like we have now. Uh, they were entering the uh, pedicle with a curet and uh, trying to empty the body, most of the body, and removing the posture part. And at the end, they were cracking the posture cortex of the body with forces applied to the posture part uh, of the spinal column. And they were placing the patient in a cast. 
uh, without any instrumentation it would heal by the months actually three to six months that there are also some uh, small modifications in such techniques like this one a, a chinese uh, a technique um, a mild opening in the front uh, there are some modifications as you can see here laminectomy and lateral osteotomies are done upper articular process of the lower vertebra removed and dura and four roots are exposed if you don't do it uh, actually you can especially in the lower lumbar levels you can uh, cause some compression of the roots on the lateral parts transverse process must be removed and the after entering the pedicle spongious bone removed with crates and or uh, using a high speed drill there are also so called osteotom uh, uh, devices uh, to uh, uh, cut posterior pa part of the cortex and to uh, uh, to push it eventually into the cavity you created yes it is not easy especially at thoracic spine and in thoracic spine may risk the spinal cord because of that many many uh, surgeons uh, if they are doing pedicle subtraction osteotomy uh, they uh, make a neuro monitoring for for patients you can in in an ankylosing spondylitis patient you can uh, place pedicle screws two up and two below and uh, you can close the osteotomy under compression uh, on the uh, screw heads or you can uh, reduce uh, the kyphosis by a table deflection as you can see here this is so-called type 3 uh, osteotomy according to the Schwab classification a shorter fixation is possible uh, in this picture uh, there, uh, the, the surgeon has done an L2 osteotomy and T12, L1 and L3 and 4 screws. In, if you, we look at the calculations, need 30 degree more lumbar lordosis than thoracic kyphosis. Uh, we must match 30 degree lumbar lordosis with 0 degree thoracic kyphosis. Match 70 degree lumbar lordosis with 40 degree thoracic kyphosis and I assume one degree correction per millimeter bond resection with uh, uh, SPO, uh, smith Peterson osteotomy, and uh, assume 30 to 35 degree correction with PSO, and uh, lordization correction is necessary, uh, and uh, in order to avoid a kinking, uh, we must uh, be careful and uh, we must close the posture gap 12 to 15 centimeters uh, maximum uh, to uh, provide a 30-35 degree correction. As I mentioned before, buckling of the dura is an issue and PSO and VCR uh, may cause buckling. Actually, the others, uh, grade 1 and 2 osteotomies, do not cause significant buckling so it is not an issue the rate of tension uh, reduction may be steeper for vcr than pso so uh, vertebral column resection uh, in vertebral column resection you must be more careful and and uh, as said before 12 to 60 millimeter posture osteotum close is essential to mi minimize uh, dural buckling what about the complications of osteotomies? There are wound problems, especially if the patient had previous surgeries. CSF leak may, may be a problem. Uh, blood loss is a problem, really. Uh, so some surgeons uh, are staging procedures uh, in uh, different uh, times. Loss of fixation is rare but non-union may happen if you don't really get a contact with PSO uh, 
on the body surfaces uh, that you removed. If there is any 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 gap, you you must place some uh, uh, autogenous bone inside uh, to avoid neurologic mon uh, worsening. You must monitor the patients, and you must be aware for coronal decompensation, especially for grade one and two osteotomies, because uh, actually if you haven't done proper releasing. So one side may get closed, the other side may not. So then you can create, uh, during uh, achieving a kyphosis reduction, you can create some uh, coronal imbalance and some scoliosis. Uh, this study uh, actually mentioning about uh, the complication rate in 140 patients Average blood loss is about 1,500 milliliters. It's so big bleeding. And reversible complications is about 11% and irreversible was, were about 2%. 2 Actually, there are some other series uh, telling that a complication rate may reach up to 40%. So we must uh, tell the pa uh, patient relatives that the complication rates may be higher. What about fusion rate? It is high if osteotum closed posteriorly, stable fixation uh, and sagittal restoration. Patient satisfaction high if sagittal restoration complete uh, without complications and patient com comorbidities are low. However, patient satisfaction is low if there happens wound infection, coronal imbalance and poor family social support. Actually, because of that, patient's motivation uh, has been found important and frailty of the patient is a, uh, is, should be a concern because in, in cases with, uh, which is not mobilizing much, uh, though you cannot achieve a good uh, result, a good outcome uh, with such a big surgery. And surgeon should prepare the patient and patient family for the worst scenario, uh, t tell them worst scenarios also. Uh, if SVA, sagittal vertical axis, is less than 8 cm, results are better. If it is more, then uh, you, you need to make more corrections, uh, especially uh, some, in some instances you may need multiple levels PSO. If osteotopy down for pseudoarthrosis revision, uh, then the results are not good, uh, somewhat worse. This is from 2007 study. I will show you some examples. Uh, this is a 35 years old male, ankylosing spondylitis for, for many years, and uh, he, he had a progressive kyphosis. It was a good candidate uh, for a uh, posture osteotomy. Actually, you can uh, we we couldn't place him in a MR machine very nicely. Uh, this is this is his walking style. Uh, actually, those patients cannot see the faces of other persons uh, when they are standing. Uh, and actually seeing the sky is a happiness. Uh, uh, and these are some steps from, from surgery. Uh, this anesthetist intubated him uh, with la uh, lateral position. Uh, and then uh, this is the uh, prone position. Uh, the, the, the table must be flexed too much. These are some uh, stages of surgery. We did a four level uh, with skipping levels, uh, PSO. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a video. Uh, sorry for quality, it is not very good, but uh, this is after examining the levels uh, after finishing, actually, we must be sure that the uh, roots are free and the posterior parts of the cortex, the body cortex, 
has been uh, removed well. We have placed the, the rod and uh, screws and uh, we are applying some forces on the screw heads. Yes, this is the end uh, with, with bone grafts on it uh, at the end. And this is before surgery on the up and after surgery po during position Actually, you see how much uh, reduction could we have achieved uh, during surgery. This is before and after. And this is again before and after. So, the patient became very happy with that. Uh, and he was this SVA has uh, recovered not to normal but almost uh, five centimeters. Yes. What about cervical thoracic kyphosis? I will tell you something about that, and I, I will finish my talk. It may be done at C7 or T1 level. Uh, actually, Mason and Uris was making that type of surgery in sitting position uh, and under local anesthesia. It's in 1960s, many, many years before. But uh, it, it is not an easy surgery uh, and under local anesthesia. And at the end of, uh, after correction of the uh, uh, C7 osteotomy, they were providing that uh, correction with a traction device which was which was applied to the ceiling of the uh, operating room and uh, they were placing since at that time there was not good implants to uh, hold the spine they were applying a whole body uh, uh, cast uh, to the patient why C7 and T1? Because there is no vertebral artery and it's easier for, for, for a uh, posterior osteotomy because the kinking of the artery is not an issue. Uh, however, at C66 or upper levels, uh, the kinking of the artery may happen. These are some steps from an atlas. Yes. This is the, at the end. A halo device with a body cast uh, and uh, the patient stays in this de device for six months, so then no uh, no implants. This is a male patient with ankylosing spondylitis. I have done many years before. As you can see, when he's uh, in, in spine position, how much is the uh, is the kyphosis? This is C7 posterior osteotomy. These are C8 nerve roots, and uh, I have done it uh, in the prone position with the Mayfield head clamp and uh, after releasing Mayfield head, head clamp we reduced it by some deflection of the head. So this is closing the gap in below. And this is two levels above, two levels below uh, posture fixation. This is pre-op and this is post-op. But she, she, he has still some kyphosis in the in the thoracic spine we didn't correct it what about this 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 case is is the most difficult one i've seen uh, she was not able to see us uh, even when uh, sitting down on a chair in in uh, standing up uh, never it was impossible the gantry was not allowing him her to to get a good uh, spine uh, film and also the uh, MR image and the the, the manubrium sternum was was compressing to the, uh, to the chin and there was few gap between uh, her mandible and the chest this is intubation is the big greatest difficulty with such patients 
they have done it uh, using a fiber optic uh, endoscope and uh, I did the surgery in two stage per, uh, session uh, one is uh, for thoracic spine in sitting position this is pre-op and post-op you can tell me that there is not much difference yes it seems like this but we our fingers are able to en enter the uh, below the ch chin this is the second uh, stage two two weeks later uh, and uh, we did a posterior osteotomies at c67 c71 and t23 levels and we lanchant it and this is after surgery and this is after surgery we have to keep the patient in halo for a while because very osteoporotic spine and this is uh, when she was walking in conclusion posture osteotomy is an effective technique for kyphosis shoe up grade one two three osteotomies are best done in ankylosing spondylitis patients and shoreman's kyphosis patients pso is safer in lumbar levels than thoracic spine Posterior facet resections show up 1, 2 or Smith-Peterson uh, and uh, Ponte osteotomies may provide 5 to 15 degrees correction at each level. So multiple levels uh, should be done. Uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy provides 30 degrees of correction at, at one level. Complications of PSO are higher than Schwab grade 1 and 2 osteotomies. Uh, and they, they, they may be neurological deficit bleeding and wood problems. Thank you for your attention. Mehmet, it was good that you showed that you did not correct the last patient under local anesthesia because surely that would have been difficult surgery also for a patient if it's local anesthesia. Right. <laughs> was, uh, right, uh, right. But uh, yeah, of course, um, it's, uh, it's very interesting cases and um, my comment would be uh, your cases were showing that you go for correction, you do significant correction, but you don't necessarily um, aim full correction. And uh, because no. it's sometimes very easy to, not very easy, but it's not difficult to go for over correction if you are aiming too much. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Mehmet, I have a question for you. How do you select the levels for PSO? Which levels to do? If it is a uh, smooth kyphosis, uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis, I mean, uh, I prefer L1 or L3, or L2, doesn't matter, L1, L2, and L3, because it is a cauda level, it's easier. However, if it is more a, a thoracic kyphosis, then, then uh, you can choose uh, uh, skipping level of thoracic spine uh, to correct the, uh, the uh, kyphosis. Multiple. How do you decide whether to do PSO at one level or multiple levels? PSO one level may be sufficient, but sometimes it does not. So then, uh, as you, you have seen in the other patient, it was 110 degree uh, of kyphosis. I did three levels uh, PSO. First male patient. Uh, Mehmet, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, really amazing cases and we are all really impressed. I would like to ask you about C7 uh, osteotomy. Was it typical classical PSO osteotomy or was it just opening wedge osteotomy as performed at the very beginning of this technique, meaning removal of posterior elements and cracking the spine during flexion of head. No, no, it is it is real pedicle subtraction. So you excised exactly the wedge from the C7 yeah. vertebral body. Right, that's what exactly. I wanted to know. Yeah, yeah. I close the I close the posture defect uh, with with is uh, removing the posture part of the body. Exactly. That's good. Thanks. Thank you. So if the viewers have any questions, they can type in the message box and then we can post it to Mehmet. Okay. So, meanwhile, we can go to the next talk by owner.
who will be taking the part two of posterior uh, fixation techniques. Is the voice clean? Sandeep, Nikolai? Yes, all good. Yeah. Hello to everyone. My speech will be a continuous part of Zilla Listo. So, uh, according to Schwab classification, uh, corner osteotomy is type 4 osteotomy. And type 5, if you remove the total vertebral segment, and if you remove one more than one segment, it's type 6. So, uh, corner osteotomy has been described by Bariano and La Martina. In this technique, you have to remove all the pedicle here. This is not a well uh, drawn figure, but you have to remove all the pedicle here uh, until the disc space. So also you also remove the disc, the above disc, and also you remove the below disc and you put a cliff cage inside. So it's uh, determined for, for the lumbar area. And they say that also according to literature, you may correct the spine for 50 or 60 degrees. So when you remove, this part, you put an interbody cage, then you close the posterior part and you allows you to correct the spine for 50 degrees. So this is not an exact, exact uh, corner osteotomy, but to have an idea about it, this is the corpus of L2. This is the L2 uh, nerve root. This is nerve, uh, L3 nerve root. You remove the pedicles here on both sides. Then you have to remove a triangular shape. This is the above disc, this is the below disc. Then you may use a uh, kerosene roger here, impactors, or you may use high speed drill here. Then you have to get a triangular shape following uh, this vertebral body until the disc here. So I pass this parts. Then, first, uh, the tricks of this technique is you have to remove the disc space here. Again, uh, remove the below disc, but before closing the uh, pedicle substruction or the corner osteotomy side, you will need to put an interbody cage below the disc. So it will help you to close and it will help you to increase the uh, cantilever uh, distance. So you, you may close it more easy. So while you're closing the osteotomy side, you need a temporary rod here. During your all maneuvers, you don't have to remove the rod because you may uh, it may cause translation of the uh, span in the coronal plane and also in the sagittal plane. So when you're closing this area, you need only to deflex the table. And uh, during all these maneuvers, you need uh, neuro monitoring during the surgery. As Zilali has mentioned, you see there is a buckling here. So while you're checking the nerve roots here, you also see if there is a buckling in the spinal cord or not. Another uh, point here is uh, they say that you have to try to keep uh, the bone to touch together. But as in this case, while you're trying to uh, touch the bone parts that you have resected, you may lose the neuromonitoring during the uh, surgery. Now, the thing that you're doing in this surgery was we lose uh, the latency of the uh, neuromonitoring. So we try to enlarge the decompression area here. So at the end of the surgery, when you're closing the both sides, this two uh, nerve roots is coming in only one foramen here. We call it as giant foramen here. So try to close the pedicle uh, osteotomy sites, the bones together. But the most important thing here is to keep uh, on neuromonitoring. So what we are doing during the surgery is not compressing the screws here because most of the adult degenerative scoliosis cases have osteoporosis. Just use the table. The only thing that you have to do is deflexing the table. 
So this is an example for that. This is the caudal part. This is the cranial part. We put the screws. The temporal root is placed inside. The only thing that you have to do is just deflex the table. We are deflexing the table, just looking to neuro monitoring if is everything is fine. So everything is fine, you may go on. But during the surgery, you have to keep, you're not flexing it again, you're just trying to keep the cranial part here. This is the cranium, this is the caudal part. We're deflexing the table. During this maneuver, the head is coming down. Now we're posi positioning the head parallel to the floor. We're uh, repeating this maneuver two or three times. At the end, you see at the beginning of the surgery, the distance between the bones were, were like this. And when we st stop the surgery, finish the surgery, the distance of the bones, the cranial and caudal bones, has uh, decreased when we're uh, closing the table. So this is a case example for corner osteotomy. This was uh, a severe uh, sagittal imbalance were in this patient. So uh, the patient had previous three lumbar disc surgeries and bent in time. So how can you uh, plan what what has your has to be your plan before the surgery? So we need the scoliosis graph. We need the necessary measurements here. Uh, I have has shown some examples. So how do we have to decide the level of the osteotomy and type of the osteotomy? So SurgeonMap and other uh, softwares allows you to have an idea before the surgery what will happen if you do a pedicle substruction osteotomy at L4. So when you do a L4 pedicle osteotomy here, pedicle substruction osteotomy here, so the SPA was uh, 31 centimeter, it comes to 17, it will be not uh, fine enough. So we change it, uh, pedicle osteotomy plus a ponte type four, sorry, type three and uh, one type two osteotomy. It again did not work. So we added one type two osteotomy more. So we have seen that uh, pedicle substruction osteotomy and ponte osteotomy will be not enough for that patient. So we changed the strategy. So we uh, wanted to see that if a type four osteotomy will work on this patient. So if you apply a uh, type four osteotomy at L4 level, so it will be much better, but it's not still enough. So we had it one type two, and also again, a second extra ponte osteotomy. So the plan was that now you see the S phase in the normal range now, with one type four and two double uh, type two osteotomies. So we have decided to uh, fix this patient from T10 to iliac link here, because as you see, if you do this osteotomy uh, more distally or more caudally, you can correct the spine more. And it's more physiologically, because you know that lumbar lordosis, uh, two thirds of this part belongs to L4, L5, L5, S1. So if you do this, this, this osteotomies, you have two advantages. The first one is, you may correct the spine, you may get this patient more back, and uh, it will be available for your lumbar lordosis distribution. But the disadvantage of this technique, if you do this osteotomies to L4, you have to go to iliac wings because you may uh, you uh, have only one fixation point if you do your osteotomy at the L4 level. If you do it L3, you may stop at L5, but you cannot bring the spine as you, much as you want. So this was our strategy before the surgery, starting from T10 to iliac wing. Then you see the shape of the root, and I have also uh, shown some examples of preventing roots uh, suitable for the patient. So this is the tree, the image of the root. The thing that you're doing, you're giving this uh, shape of the road and the length, we know everything now, the shape, 
the diameter and also the length of the rod here. So this is the print on your paper, on the paper. So we give this rod and we want to bend this rod according to this shape before the surgery. These are the roads that we have prepared before the surgery. So the only thing that you have to do during the surgery, you have to make the spine flexible. You have to release the vertebra so that you can put the roads very easily without forcing any uh, forces inside. So these are the uh, X-ray that we get during the surgery. So this is the x-ray that we have at the caudal this is the x-ray that we have got from the caudal so we have combined it on the uh, computer during the surgery so we see we have a lumbar lordosis uh, 33 degree lumbar lordosis we have measured everything before the surgery so how much lumbar lordosis will that patient need that's the pelvic incidence we get uh, the agent size so this is the clinical photographs and also the x-rays of that patient before and after the surgery. So this was before the surgery, the SVA was uh, 31 and the SVA was uh, 1.7 centimeter after the surgery. So we could do what we have planned before the surgery. And uh, this is another uh, example, 60 years old female had bended uh, forward in time, has back pain and also bilateral leg pain. So to plan, before planning an osteotomy, the level and the type of the osteotomy, you need the sagittal planes, the scoliosis crafts. So we made uh, the measurements here, again, a very high uh, SVA we had before the surgery. So. We have again tried it, pedicle substruction osteotomy at L2, L4, it didn't work. The only thing that was working here was a pedicle, uh, sorry, corner osteotomy at L4 level. So this is the view during the surgery and this is after the surgery, the clinical photographs and also uh, the x-rays of that patient. Another case, uh, that we have used um, corner osteotomy and also uh, kickstand and uh, tie rod technique. So uh, we know that in adult degenerative scoliosis cases, we have uh, scoliosis, the sagittal uh, imbalance, and also we have corner imbalance. This was the first time that we used the kickstand rod technique. Kickstand rod technique is you put an extra uh, screw on the iliac link here, then you use an extra rod, you combine this extra rod to your main rods here with a uh, domino here. So the only thing that you have to do is distract this extra rod and you try to bring the spine to the mid midline. So we have failed in this surgery. Then what we have done, uh, just change the direction of the screw and I only distracted and I could bring it uh, onto the midline in the second revision surgery. So this is the technique. You put an iliac screw, you put an extra root with the helping of this root. So the, during this technique, you had to uh, lose all the screw heads on the corner imbalance side. Then you have to fix the screw on the iliac thing. And you have to use a strong holder here then you distract it. So this is the technique how we apply it. This, this was the revision surgery. So we changed the direction of the screw. Then This is the right side, this is the left side. So we tighten the head of the screw on the iliac wing here. Then we use a strong rod holder here and just 
this track here. The tip of this technique is you have to lose all the screw heads here. So during the surgery, you'll see the patient is coming to the midline here. So we could correct this patient on the uh, coronal plane, but because of the distraction maneuvers uh, on the sagittal plane, you see there was a better SVA, but after the surgery, we increased the SVA because of the distraction maneuvers when you're thinking on the sagittal plane. So this is another technique. This is tyro technique. When you use a kickstand technique and you bring this patient on the coronal plane to the midline, you lose the sagittal balance. You increase the sagittal balance on the sagittal plane. Then you have to use another extra rod on the other side. So if you use again a domino here, and if you just compress it on that side, like you're wearing a tie, you just bring this patient back, like in this case. So um, after these two experiences, we started to use double rods with using kickstand also and using tyro technique. So we can maintain this patient's also sagittal plane and also sagittal balance and also the coronal balance here. So these are the case examples that we're using double rods here. These are my last words. We have talked about the techniques. So we have to know that the complication rates of adolescent, uh, sorry, adult degenerative scoliosis are very high. And 50% of these uh, surgeries needs revision surgeries. If you can do it, do it minimally invasive surgery. And if you can do the corrections with low grade osteotomies, I mean with Ponte osteotomies or Smith Patterson osteotomies, with applying it to multiple levels, try to do it in that way. Because using, uh, let's say, high grade osteotomies like pedicle substruction type 3, corner osteotomy type 4, BCR type 5, you will have more complication traits. So if you can do it with multiple low grade osteotomies, try to do it in that way. Thank you so much for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Onur. Um, Onur again demonstrated uh, the surgeon that I know who is not afraid to take uh, very, very complicated cases and to do them well. And uh, it was uh, very interesting cases. Onur, I guess you operate also a bit more normal cases, which are not this heavily uh, um, curved. So um, my my question would be, what is your take on the modern technology? Um, I'll give you a clue what I exactly mean. Um, for example, I have now here expandable cage that is giving me 15 degrees inbuilt angle. So do you use this? And uh, would that, if you use that, would that uh, make you use less uh, aggressive uh, posterior osteotomy techniques? Like good questions. First of all, uh, at my uh, last uh, slide, I've seen that if you can do it with minimal invasive, do it with minimal invasive. So the new trend is that uh, divide the surgeries, if you can, into two parts and just uh, put the interbody cages in one uh, session. And in another session, you can put it percutaneously. It will allow you to decrease the fusion levels and using the interbody cages will help you to maintain the sagittal balance. They have uh, less bleeding, less uh, operation time. So the new trend is that if you have the chance to use it with interbody cages that allows you 15 or 13 or 17 degrees lumbar lower doses, you may use it. So if you do, if you can do it with uh, multiple low-grade osteotomies, Smith Patterson Ponte osteotomies, try that way. Because uh, bringing this osteotomies to a higher level means pedicle subtraction, VCR, corner osteotomy. The bleeding uh, is increasing. Uh, the surgery time is increasing. Because of the quality of the bone, you may have some problems. Because of uh, the fusions, you may have pull-out problems. In a few cases, we have 
than a perfect osteotomy, we put this screw. While closing this area, you will see you're losing that screw. It comes out. So the only thing is to try to push it down. So in some cases, we let the spine as much as we can correct it. So we have to try it in minimal invasive surgeries. Doing a surgery like starting from T10 and iliac is increasing our uh, complication rates. It's increasing the bleeding. The patients are elderly patients. And without using the double rules, even you're using double rules, you have rod breakage, uh, pull out problems. So uh, before the surgery, we have to tell the complication rates, we have to tell the revision rates. So the patients are seeing the films, you know, everything is fine. I want to stand straight like that. So you, they have to know the complication, also the revision rates. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, thank you so much. I You're don't welcome. have any uh, any more questions. Any other faculty? Any comments? Or we proceed doesn't further? Sand doesn't Sandeep have any question to me? <laughs> oh, no, you are. I, I'm sure what Nicole said that you are a brave surgeon. <laughs> and you take up most challenging cases. And I must say that uh, in my deforms, the few deformity cases I have done, owner and members helped me from a distance. But how to plan it? So. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honor. It was great presentation. Um, now we can uh, go further. We have uh, gone through the posterior techniques for correction. So we are going now laterally. Uh, Imad, do you want to play Mirza's uh, talk? So Mirza Poiskic is a, a neurosurgeon that works in Germany. Um, he is a representative of the World Spinal Con uh, World Federation Neurosurgery um, Spine Committee. Unfortunately, he is not with us because he's also traveling and he kindly uh, provided uh, recorded uh, talk. Um, I'm sure if there's any questions, me and the other faculty will be possible to comment and to, to answer questions. Okay, uh, go ahead, Imad, thank you. Okay, I don't see the presentation. Okay, good. This for the spine are a pretty broad subject and they Dear faculty, dear colleagues, dear participants, welcome to the WSCS, WFNS, ENS, how I do it. Session five, adult degenerative deformity correction on lateral deformity correction techniques. My name is Mirza Proiskic. I'm neurosurgeon, spine surgeon, and I work at Department of Neurosurgery, University Clinic Marburg, Germany. Lateral approaches for the spine are a pretty broad subject and they include lateral approaches for complex coliosis surgery, which includes thoracic and lumbar spine, as well as lateral approaches for the lumbar spine. In my practice, I deal mostly with X-lifts for discectomies and corpectomies, so that is going to be the primary subject of my talk. Lateral lumbar interbody fusion, also known as XLIF, extreme lateral interbody fusion, that is a trademark from the company Nuvasiv, or direct lateral interbody fusion as a trademark company Medtronic, is a relatively novel technique which is first described in its current form in a paper by Otskur from the year 2005. Indications include interbody access from L1 to L5, ideally for L2 to 4, since in the level L1 and 2, 12 rib comes in a way in the level L4, 5, the, subject, the approach is limited by iliac crest. Uh, XLIF is usually used in combination with posterior stabilization. It is a rarely standalone construct, yet example 
there are standalone ICLIFs for correction or adjacent segment disease. Its primary indications are degenerative disc disease, uni or bilateral neuroforaminal stenosis, degenerative spondylolisthesis grade 1 or 2, osteoporosis due to lead subsidence by large foot cages, and revision surgeries following failed posterior surgery for case loosening and subsidence, which reduces the risk of nerve root lesions, postoperative radiculitis, durotomies, and compared to posterior fusion techniques. Contraindications include spondylolisthesis grade 3 and more, lumbar deformity which with more than 30 grades, and bilateral retroperitoneal scarring. Results, what we want to achieve with ICLIPS are increased interbody height, restoration of collapse or deformity, and stabilization of interbody motion. Knowledge of the surgical anatomy is crucial for maximal patient benefit and complication avoidance. The most critical anatomy is the distribution of the lumbar plexus within the psoas muscle because the approach requires the use of a dilator or retractor to transverse the psoas muscle which places the lumbar plexus at the risk of injury. The paired muscles, psoas muscles, form a major part of the posterior abdominal wall. They arise from roots of the lumbar transverse processes, pass infralaterally, and insert into the less trochanter of the femur. Another major component of the posterior wall is the paired quadratus lumborum muscles, which form a thick muscular sheet in the posterior abdominal wall. The lumbar plexus is embedded mainly in the posterior portion of the psoas anterior to the lumbar transfer processes. It is composed of the ventral rami of the L1 through L4 roots, and major cutaneous branches include ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves, genitofemoral nerve, and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. The genitofemoral nerve pierces the anterior surface of the psoas muscle and it runs inferiorly deep to the psoas fascia. The two major motor branches are obturator nerve, L2-4, to which supplies the adductor muscles and the femoral nerve, which emerges from the posterior far part of the lateral border of psoas muscle and thus supplies the hip flexors and knee extensors. Excluding the genitofemoral nerve, roots and critical branches are, were found to be overlapping with the dorsal half of the vertebral column above L4-5 to in a lateral projection view. The genitofemoral nerve uh, transfers through the psoas to emerge on the ventral surface between the rostral third of the L3 and the L4 vertebral bodies. Indirect decompression is one important indication for ICLIF, especially in a case of a neuroforaminal stenosis and bony lateral recess stenosis was found to be the only significant predictor of failed indirect compression after ICLIF. Lateral interbody fusion is a technique which is used as well as by orthopedic surgeons as by neurosurgeons. Orthopedic surgeons tend to measure the correction deformity using several Cobb angles. In the study published in our department, it was found that the most profit from this surgery is gained in patients who are hypoallergenic with L1 S1 angle less than 40 degrees, and that important results of ICLIP surgery are increase in L1 S1 angle, increase in L1 L5 Cobb angle, increase in L5 S1 angle, S1 angle, and also increase of disc height. Also, there are several publications on the role of measurements of pelvic incidence for outcome assessment of ICLIF. Complications of ICLIF surgery are differently reported in the literature. While some literature review report extremely high risks of neuro injury, especially compared to the posterior and anterior decompression techniques, some other reviews and single and multicenter studies report a very low major complication rate of 0.7% or 0.03% with major vascular injury as a bowel injury and surgical site infection which occur uh, very rarely. Vertebral body fracture and contralateral nerve injury are something which is frequently uh, met upon even in the studies with low complication rate 
and the ipsilateral iliopsoas paresis or hip flexion paresis is also a complication which is mostly transient in nature and which occurs on the side where the ipsilateral surgery is performed. As for clinical and radiological outcomes, almost all studies report reduced pain and quality of life uh, scores uh, with clinical improvement. Fusion rate has been imp uh, reported to be from 75 to 99 percent and without differences between standalone construct compared to supplemental fixation. Uh, disc height area has been shown to improve more in XLIF with a significantly increased axial canal area in uh, M and in tail lift versus x lift and all lift, the correction of lumbar lodotic angle and segmental sagittal angle were similar, whereas all lift and x lift groups showed less blood loss and shorter hospital stays than tail lift groups. There was no significant difference in fusion rate among all groups, and factors thought to contribute to cage subsidence are the narrower 18 millimeter cages, osteoporosis, the use of bone morphogenetic protein, the use of stem down cages, nitrogenic end plate violation. Taller cage height, narrower cage width, and shorter cage length were significantly associated with increased risk of cage settling more than 4 mm at 12 months postoperatively, where there was no cage setting immediate, settling immediately postoperatively. Risk of settling more than 4 mm was 6.8 times greater with narrower cages. Addition of posterior instrumentation is associated with decreased reoperations and cage movements. In one study, titanium cages were associated with lower subsidence rates than peak cages, and usage of recombinant human BMPs was robustly associated with higher end plate subsidence. Several studies examined the relationships between parameters of spinal pelvic alignment and standalone x lip surgery, and these are the results. It is interesting to note that XLIF can increase the disc height by almost 75%, the surface area of the foramen and central clinic by 36 and 25.4% respectively, as one recent study has shown. This is a case of 71 years old patients with large intra and extra foraminal herniated disc L1 2 and segmental instability. He underwent a posterior surgery from which he did not gain profit. He had very severe pain going to his groin on the right side and a hip flexion paresis. In the CT, we see a complete collapse of the intervertebral space and a neuroforminal stenosis on the right side. He underwent an x lift surgery, as you can see on the intraoperative x rays and postoperative CTs with an increased disc height, increased uh, uh, mean foraminal area, central canal area. Prior to x lift surgery, he underwent a percutaneous minimally invasive pedicle screw fixation for monosegmental instability. This is one further case of a patient who underwent a stabilization L3 to S1 and now had an adjacent segment disease with instability L2-3 and the herniated disc L2-3 on the right side. This patient underwent an extension of the spinal construct and x lift in two heights, L2-3 and l 1, 2. As you can see on the postoperative CT and X ray scan, he had an increased disc height correction of the deformity and increase of the mean foraminal area with, dire with direct and indirect decompression of the neuroforaminal stenosis. XLIP can be performed as open surgery, endoscopic surgery, and minimally invasive surgery. Key steps for minimally invasive surgery are preoperative planning, needle electrode setup, patient positioning, fluoroscopic localization, dissection to the psoas muscle, neuromonitoring through the psoas muscle, sequential dilation and retractor placement, disc preparation, implant insertion, and closure. Preoperative planning includes examination of anterior, posterior, and lateral lumbar X rays carefully to identify any anatomic abnormalities. For example, high iliac crest at L4 5 may prevent straightforward access to the L4 5 
uh, disk space. It also includes choosing the side of the approach, usually minimally invasive. XLIF is approached from the left side. However, for degenerative scoliosis, the approach is usually from the side of the convexity. Uh, because of potential injury to the lumbar plexus during the transverse approach, real-time EMG monitoring of the lumbar plexus and roots must be implemented. Uh, the anesthesiologist uses only short-acting neuromuscular blocking agent for induction. Uh, EMG is performed for the medial and lateral quadriceps, anterior tibialis, gastrocnemius, and adductor muscles on the side of the surgery, which is a standard and X-slip uh, dilators in case of a new invasive system also have stimulating electrodes at the tips and a stimulating clip to touch to the opposite end allowing real-time EMG monitoring. The patient is placed on a radiolucent operating table in true lateral decubitus position. The iliac crest is usually aligned with the break of the radiolucent surgical table with axillary roll placed to protect the neurovascular structures in the axilla with padding between the arms and legs to remain, uh, to be sure to remain suspended in neutral position. The top leg should be flexed to relax the psoas muscle and prevent spreading of the nerves across the psoas muscle and padding is placed beneath and between the legs from the knee uh, distally. The patient is then secured with a tape and placed in a slight reverse Rendelenburg position. The head of the table is dropped and the slight flexion is applied to the surgical table which allows better access to the lumbar spine. The patient is in a plane which is perpendicular to the floor so that lateral fluoroscopy can, can provide good quality unobstructed images of the disc space. For fluoroscopy control, first a true AP image should be obtained to ensure the patient is positioned in a true lateral position where clear and distinct pedicles are equidistant from the spinose process. In case where the patient already received the stabilization, this could be achieved more easily. Then a lateral X-ray is obtained and clear and distinct end plates should be seen. And it is critical that the C-arm remain in the 0 and 90 degree position all the times to ensure a safe lateral working channel. For multi-level cases, you should rotate the surgical table independent of the C-arm to adjust images for each level. Um, using um, uh, by uh, using uh, the stick on the top of the skin, we usually mark uh, the entire segment on its anterior, posterior, and uh, cranial and caudal borders. After a single skin incision, the subcutaneous fat layers are dissected until the abdominal musculature. Um, the first play encountered is the external oblique fascia, the only layer that needs to be sharply incised. Um, all dissections should be parallel to the muscle fibers following the external oblique. Then we get to the internal oblique and transversalis muscle. After bluntly penetrating the transversalis fascia, the yellow retroperitoneal fat is exposed and from now on palpation is used to define the plane from the internal abdominal wall posteriorly down to the psoas muscle. For the thoracolumbal region, usually we have a 12th rib which can be in the way which can be partially resected or we can use a rib retractor for thoracolumbal area as well as for thoracic lateral cases. The retroperitoneal fat and peritoneal contents are spread formally with the surgeon's finger or a peanut elevator to allow direct access to the psoas muscle. When the psoas muscle is reached, the stimulating EMG pro is guided down to the psoas while the surgeon's finger protects the peritoneal membrane. The stimulating probe should target the anterior half to third of the disc space to avoid damage to neural structures. Monitoring is performed using 6 to 8 milliamperes of stimulation. And if an EMG response is generated at this level, the stimulating probe should be repositioned slightly anterior until a near free pathway is located. 
with the guide wire in place sequential dilation spreads the fibers of the psoas up to diameter of 22 millimeters they are free dilators and you need to be sure that each dilator reaches the disc space and to minimize the amount of residual muscle at the end of the dilators and in the end fluoroscopy can be used to confirm that each dilator has reached the disc space. The retractor is then placed over the dilators and it should not expand, be expanded past the midpoint of the vertebral body where the segmental vessels of the sending aorta typically course. Further on we perform disectomy or corpectomy when performing as well as disectomy as well as corpectomy an end plate preparation is very important as is seen in this image with a large cob which is passed along both end plates to the annulus at the contralateral side to detach the disc the mallet is then used to gently release both the superior and inferior aspects of the contralateral annulus which is a critical step to ensure adequate destruction and coronal alignment and especially important for uh, de uh, deformity correction. Both the anterior longitudinal ligament and the posterior longitudinal ligament are preserved in most circumstances. Following disectomy and corpectomy and preparation of the end plates, the disc space in case of x -lif or the corpectomy defect with to adjacent disc space is sequentially distracted with trials until adequate disc space height is obtained and foraminal size is restored. Each trial is passed through the retractor and impacted into the disc space. A properly sized trial is centered at the spinous process and so should span the ring apophysis to reach fully across the vertebral body end plate. Once trialing is complete, the central cavity of the corresponding implant is filled with graft material which is, can be an autograft or a bone morphogenetic protein or a bone stimulating substance like nanogel. After the implant is positioned in the center of the disc space in case of x lip or in the center of corpectomy, uh, the inserter is unfreaded from the implant in remove. Placing the implant over the outer rim of the end plate on each side provides maximum support to the strength of the ring apophysis and after implant insertion the stability pin is removed, the tractor system detached, the tractor blades are carefully removed. Surgical site is irrigated, fascia closed with interrupted microsurgeries and finally the subcutaneous layers and skin are closed routinely. One further intraoperative moment which you should think about is at the thoracolumbar junction, the so-called diaphragm dilemma. Um, the retroperitoneal and retropleural spaces reside within the same cavity and are separated by the lateral attachments of the diaphragm to the rib and the L1 transverse process. If the lateral attachments are dissected and diaphragm is retracted anteriorly, these spaces will be in direct continuity, allowing full access to the thoracolumbar junctions. Uh, T12 to L2 spaces can be reached by conventional lateral exposure with the rostral displacements of the L10-12 ribs. With caudally displaced ribs or to expose T12 L1 disc spaces, the diaphragm can be freed from its lateral attachments to perform a retro diaphragmatic approach and T11 to 12 space can be accessed purely uh, through a retropleural approach without significant mobilization of the diaphragm. The attachments are typically between the inferior edge of the 10th rib and the superior edge of the 12th rib. And one author in their cadaveric study proposed incision above the 10th rib for the retropleural approach and below the 12th rib for the retroperitoneal approach to avoid injury to the diaphragm. At our department, we frequently use intraoperative CT with augmented reality support for spine surgery. This is from our published work, our OR, with a typical intraoperative setting. 
using intraoperative CT based navigation with automatic registration for lateral approaches to the spine and using microscope based augmented reality it is possible to gain a very good overview of the surgical field which increases the patient's safety and orientation while performing surgery. Following intraoperative registration scan for automatic registration, it is important to check the accuracy of the registration scan as well as accuracy of the control scan. Techniques how to check this with the navigation pointer are shown on this slide on the left side. In the middle and on the right side, we see a case of a patient who had a herniated thoracic disc, which was operated via transthoracic lateral transplural approach involving a minimally invasive technique and a small skin incision. In the middle we see a reconstruction of the intraoperative preoperative MRI and intraoperative CT with a focus pointer on the herniated disc. On the right side the preoperative and postoperative MRIs which show the complete resection of the herniated disc and on the right lower side an intraoperative situation showing the X-lift retractors with outlines of the vertebras in yellow and outlines of the herniated discs in blue so that microscope based augmented reality increased the patient safety and orientations in a way where when it showed where it showed the exact location of the herniated disc and in that case directed the preparation and the and the course of sequester sequestrectomy. This is a further case of 38 years old female patient with severe, severe paraparesis and a calcified herniated disc in the thoracic spine. She underwent a surgery, a posterior surgery without costal transversectomy, unfortunately, uh, for a partial resection and the compression of the uh, spinal cord. Her symptoms worsened afterwards and she came to our department with a uh, high-grade paraparesis of the lower extremities. The patient underwent uh, surgery via a lateral minimally invasive approach in the thoracic spine using uh, X-lift retractor, um, intraoperative CT-based navigation and microscope-based augmented reality. This is the initial exposure where the outlines of the vertebras are shown in yellow and the outlines of the herniated discs in blue. The patient underwent sequestrami of the calcified herniated disc via minimally invasive lateral transthoracic approach to the spine using microscope-based augmented reality and intraoperative CT-based navigation. The outlines of the vertebras are shown in yellow and outlines of the herniated disc in blue. This largely facilitated the orientation and surgical field so that the herniated disc could be drilled out until the dura could be shown and the last slide on the uh, right and down shows a complete anterolateral decompression of the dura with complete resection of the herniated disc. And this was also confirmed on the intraoperative CT, control CT, which was fused with preoperative navigation CT and the preoperative CT, the thoracic spine, where the complete resection of the herniated disc has been shown. The patient recovered and had only a slight ataxia with a complete, um, a complete and full recovery of the motor symptoms. This is a further case of a patient with a T12 uh, compression fracture with a significant spinal canal stenosis and a kyphotic deformity on the thoracolumbal area. This patient received a robotic assisted percutaneous minimally invasive dorsal stabilization and then 
as a second surgery, a lateral corpectomy and implantation of the expandable vertebral body cage. As we see in the control CTs, this led to a significant correction of the deformity. This is a patient with severe spondylodicitis at the L3, L4, and with a complete osteodestruction of these two vertebras, he underwent also a lateral approach. We have here a few intraoperative X-rays, which show the position of the, which, which show the preoperative uh, skin incision planning, the intraoperative position of the X-ray retractor, as well as AP and sagittal position of the expandable vertebral body cage and the control CT which shows correct position of the implant. X-ray surgery is especially good for cases of spondylodicitis since it enables removal of large portion of infected discs and vertebras which led, leads then to a quicker resolution of the infection. Lateral approaches can also be used for revision surgeries. On the left side there is a patient who underwent a thoracolumbar stabilization for spondylodicitis at the L12. He had a fa construct failure and a high-grade paraparesis. He underwent removal of the two screws in the destroyed vertebras and implantation of the expandable vertebral body cage. The patient on the right had received also two uh, posterior fixation and implantation of two x lift cages. He had a loosening of the lower x lift cage at L4-5 and a subsequent removal of both x lift cages and implantation of the expandable body cage in lateral, real lateral approach has been performed. In preparation for this webinar, I've consulted my uh, good friend and colleague, Dr. Samir Smajic, who's an orthopedic surgeon and does a lot of prone X-lift cases. He uh, lent me a case of a 39 years old female patient with adipositas, little back pain, sciatica and insufficient surgery five months before with TLA free to four due to adjustment level instability. These are the intraoperative or preoperative X-rays of the patient. These are the steps of surgery execution and the reason why we show this case is the prone X-lift technique. The intraoperative setting has been shown here. As you can see, the patient is a prone position so that the simultaneous posterior and lateral surgery can be performed. The prone X-lift surgery is performed with the exact same instruments and with an X-lift retractor as the traditional X-lift surgery in the lateral position. Post-operative X-ray shows uh, real or doses and the correction of the monosegmental deformity. One further variant of the lateral surgery is oblique lateral interbody fusion. That is a MIS access to the disc space via corridor between the peritoneum and psoas muscle, first described in 1977. It does not dissect or traverse the psoas muscle. And a lateral and paramedian incision is uh, performed based on position angulation of the disc on image intensification when the patient in position. This is shown in these slides in the open access uh, paper which I've cited um, above. Neuromonitoring is not necessary as the anatomical corridor anterior to the psoas muscle is used for access and the olive technique is suitable for levels L1 to S1. The indications for olive surgery are similar to indications for X-lift surgery. It is contraindicated in patients with severe central canal stenosis and high-grade spondylolisthesis. And one specific complication is a venous injury, left iliac vein or iliolumbar lumbar vein, which can be direct repaired with gel foam and or uh, with gel foam and thrombin.
Potential risks also include sympathetic dysfunction and vascular injury. This paper examined differences between Ixlif, Olif, and Alif. One important thing to tell a patient who is going through Ixlif surgery is the transient motor weakness with a sensory deficit usually on the ipsilateral side or on the side where the Ixlif is performed that it is not very uncommon but that it is transient in its nature and it is probably going to recover. The rate of complications of other major complications such as major vascular injury, lung injury, diaphragm injury, injury to the bowel, retroperitoneal hematoma, and other major complications have a comparably low incidence compared to other minimally invasive techniques for the lumbar fusion or for the spine fusion in general. I'm a neurosurgeon and I don't perform the complex scoliosis surgery, but lateral approaches for scoliosis have also been extensively performed and published. This is one of the uh, studies which appeared uh, recently, and this study has shown that Ixla with posterior percutaneous pedicle screw instrumentation provides up to 40 to 75 percent correction of coronal curves with modest increase of lower doses and only enter Ixlip can provide legs correction. There was a new classification for use of Ixlip in scoliosis surgery. This is also an open access papers so for, for everyone who wants to know more about uh, lateral approaches for scoliosis uh, it is uh, highly recommended. We have talked about minimally invasive except surgery Apart from that, there are also endoscopic ICLIP surgery, especially in the thoracic spine, for example, transpular pleural endoscopic discectomy or corpectomy with implantation of the cage or expandable vertebral body cage. There is a whole world of lateral approaches from the, for the spine, from the really minimally invasive to lateral approaches like shown in this case with large open surgeries and long spinal fusion con uh, constructs which attributed to better correction of the coronal deformity in combination of the posterior fixation. Thank you for your attention. So it was a bit of a long presentation, and um, for some reason we uh, we lost control. And I don't know what's happening. You, Matt, if you hear me, um, yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, okay, all right. Um, so um, I guess we'll uh, leave the comments for for the end. It was very informative and but a, bit, a rather long presentation and. Uh, uh, I was not possible to, to do anything about that, apologies. So uh, we're gonna continue further with Anjay. Anjay uh, mm -hmm. is uh, a neurosurgeon, professor neurosurgeon who is uh, having the hat of the ENS today with us. He is with, uh, a representative of the European Association of Neurosurgeons. Um, his practice is in uh, Poland and he's gonna talk to us about anterior approaches today. I can't wait to, to see what he will tell us about that. Sanjay. Uh, yes, uh, uh, can you hear me guys well? Yes, everything is okay. Can you see the first slide? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, we can see. Okay, that's great. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for, of this webinar uh, for having me here as a faculty. Uh, this is my great honor and pleasure. Uh, Mehmet and Honor gave you an excellent overview of their personal experience in correction of deformities through the posterior approach, and that was really very impressive. And their talks clearly showed how much aggressive and invasive can be correction of deformities through the posterior approach. 
especially when PSO and a higher grade osteotomies have to be employed. Even PSO, which is only grade three out of six grades of osteotomy, is horribly invasive in terms of blood loss and traction to the nerve roots. Uh, whenever I talk on PSO, I recall the lecture by Sebastian Sharowski. He gave during conference uh, of the Polish Society of Spine Surgery a few years ago. Dr. Sharowski, as you may know, in a, is an excellent French spine surgeon from Toulouse in France. And he said, let me cite him, I did many PSOs in my life and I regret majority of them. Of course, it was a kind of ironic, but only to characterize PSO as a really invasive procedure carrying significant rate of perioperative and late postoperative complications. So I could say that PSO is a kind of blood spilling or bloodshed procedure. That is why the idea to replace PSO with less invasive but equally effective techniques in correction of deformities emerged some time ago. Anterior approaches uh, come to mind as a natural replacement for PSO because they are much less invasive than PSO. We'll come back to this in a moment. You can see how invasive it is a procedure. This is just PSO, which I normally do. Uh, this is really bloodshed and, and uh, nobody has doubt about that. Uh, of course, majority of deformities will never require higher grade osteotomies. And lower grade osteotomies like Smith Peterson will be enough, especially when you leverage their effect with the use of cliff cages or even wedge cliff cages. Uh, see how much effective one level cliff technique was here for total correction of sagittal imbalance. Even cliff technique can restore lordosis when you use a wedge cage. This is, for example, minimally invasive correction of degenerative spondy. Here, restoration of lordosis was achieved rather through insertion of wedged pleat than compression of screws on the rod. The question is, what is the correction capability of cages? It is between five to 15 degrees for sleeve cages. And it depends on the preoperative intervertebral angle of the interspace. The more kyphotic the interspace, the greater the correction you can achieve. Let's uh, get back to the example I showed you uh, already. Here, the segment was kyphotic before correction, so nothing surprising. I restored segmental lordosis up to 15 degrees. But here, all three segments had preoperative lordosis between zero to five degrees. So the expected segmental correction for each segment was between five to 10 degrees. And that's what, is, and that, uh, and that what I achieved during surgery. What is then correction capability of anterior cages? Until recently, it was the same as for cleave cages, but with increasing popularity of anterior correction, manufacturers introduced 20 to even 30 degrees wedge cages. And correction achieved with the use of 30 degree cage equals correction achieved with PSO. Anterior cages restore lordosis through direct lengthening of the anterior column and this is very effective. See how nice correction of lordosis was achieved with the use of four x lift cages through lateral retroperitoneal approach. Here, the retroperitoneal approach was the second stage of surgery performed after smith Patterson osteotomy and instrumentation of pedicles. Screws were not, however, connected to rods so that to leave the spine mobile and enable retroperitoneal correction with the use of x lift cages. Once it was completed, the patient was again positioned prone for the final third stage where rods were mounted on screws. When it comes to anterior correction, I use mini open olive or sometimes mini X leaf. I employ them between L1 and L5 levels. And at L5 S1, I use mini open A leaf. Both Olive and A leaf are much less invasive and aggressive than PSO. It was already uh, perfectly uh, discussed by, by Mirza. In fact, they are minimally invasive procedures because the only anatomical structure that, that is cut is either transverse abdominus muscle 
or anterior rectus sheath. Let me show you now how I do mini open A leaf at L5 S1 level. A patient is positioned supine with flexed hips and knees to achieve orientation of L5 S1 disc as vertical as possible. More vertical projection of the interspace facilitates access to the disc. So the access is from mini Fannenstiel skin incision marked under CR. I dissect. This is skin incision. I dissect subcutaneous tissue, cephalat, and caudal to create superior and inferior flap to give the vertical exposure of the anterior rectus sheath. You will see it in a moment. The anterior rectus sheath is incised longitudinally along the right side of the linear alba. This is the rectus sheath incised, and now we need to extend this incision along the right side of the linear alba. Here is the linear alba. And then the right rectus muscle is detached from the linear alba and the peritoneum exposed after division of the posterior rectus sheath. This is a peritoneum. And the rectus muscle is retracted laterally. I'm now standing on the opposite side to make it easier. The peritoneum is swept off to the, from the right to the left. And inferior epigastric vessels, you can see here, sh should be preserved. And sweeping off the peritoneum above the iliac fossa exposes the right psoas muscle, which is the first landmark in the retroperitoneal space. And further sweeping towards the midline exposes common iliac artery and its bifurcation underneath you can see common here, just here, common iliac vein. Oh, it's here. And uh, medial to them is promontorium, and this is the ureter. You can uh, recognize it by peristalsis. It should be swept together with the peritoneum. The small sacral vessels can be calculated with the use of bipolar, and at this stage, I introduce self-retaining retractor. And uh, you, you should be very careful when retracting the left side so that not to injure the left iliac vein, common iliac vein. The discectomy and preparation of end plates are completed in the regular manner. Majority of cases will require remodeling of L5 and L1 end plates because they are usually concave or convex. You will see it in a moment. I use high-speed drill for remodeling. And after this, you can drive a cage into the inner space. And as you can see, this is the only structure which is uh, really cut. Uh, this is anterior rectus shape. You need to, you need to just uh, stitch it. And, and now we'll, uh, how I do it, mini open olive oblique uh, approach. Uh, oblique approach allows to, uh, allows to avoid problems with high iliac crest, which prevents truly lateral approach as an X leaf. And the skin incision is placed on the abdomen at the L4, L5 level disc two finger breaths anterior to the iliac crest because you can see that normally in majority of people or half percent, 20 percent of them, L4, L5 is just hidden by iliac crest. This is the skin incision. And now external oblique muscle is split bluntly along its fibers. You need to protect every neuromuscular bundle and sweep it aside. And in the bottom of the wound, you can see the internal oblique muscle. So this is external. This is internal oblique. You need to split it bluntly along its fibers. And now you can see the transverse salis fascia. It needs to be split again. 
external oblique, internal oblique, and this is peritoneum after taking down the uh, transverse fascia. And you just sweep off the peritoneum uh, from the abdominus wall and until you land on the on the psoas muscle and once the this blade is um, uh, positioned on the medial border of the iliopsoas muscle and this one retracts the peritoneum and its contents so disc preparation and end place preparation are performed in a routine manner and you can uh, confine either typical a leaf cage or um, or x leaf cage like in this case if you do ample exposure you can uh, you can uh, insert we can drive in a in a leaf cage so uh, the use of anterior correction implies at least uh, 300 uh, 60 degree procedure. The anterior correction has to be combined with the posterior approach for which we secure the correction with pedicle screws. In some cases, the pure bone release can be insufficient to achieve correction of the deformity and release of soft tissue, especially the anterior longitudinal ligament may be necessary. The release of the ligament is quite easy for the anterior approach, but you can also release the anterior ligament through the posterior approach. See how I do it. This is ankylosed stiff kyphotic deformity, which I addressed through two-stage posterior anterior approach. And here the posterior elements are already removed. The disc is also removed. And you will see, I'll be cutting through the anterior digital ligament with the use of carison like, and you can see this now. So you will be see, you, you can see now the contents of the posterior mediastinum while I'm cutting through the anterior longitudinal ligament. Uh, once two-column release is completed, you are able to correct the kyphosis. And the like here, the correction is secured with pedicle screw and uh, three level above and three levels below. And the patient was then turned to the lateral decubitus position for vertebral body replacement with the use of the destruction prosthesis. Here we can see removal of a vertebral body. You can see the dural sac. These are remnants of a vertebral body. This dural sac again, and now you need to insert destruction prosthesis. And this is the final results. Uh, correction of extremely rigid deformities can take even three stages, like in this case. Uh, I use fulcrum bending radiographs to test flexibility or rigidity of the, of the spine. This case presents with fixed ankylosis at the apex of deformity. So the first stage was aimed on release of posterior elements and instrumentation of the spine with pedicle screws. Uh, the apex of the deformity is temporarily stabilized with two pairs of screws so that to secure the released site against uncontrolled destruction during anterior release and corpectomy, and thus to eliminate the risk of iatrogenic injury to the neural elements. And after corpectomy is finished, like in here, the deformity is completely released, but its correction cannot be executed now. And even the vertebral body prosthesis cannot be interposed between the vertebral bodies now because this part of the spine is still immobilized posteriorly with the pedicle screws. So the patient is again positioned prone for reduction of kyphosis, insertion of destruction prosthesis from the back and connecting rods and screws. And this was the third stage of the surgery. As you know, the only way to achieve correction of fixed rigid deformities in one stage, in one stage, is a vertebral column resection. Vertebral column resection means ex extraction of the whole vertebra from the spine through the posterior approach. And after resection of posterior elements, you must virtually extract the vertebral body from the each side of the posterior mediastinum. Uh, so this is a really huge procedure, a bloodshed procedure. Uh, and see another case of, uh, of uh, VCR. VCR is extremely invasive procedure. To take out the whole vertebra from the spine, you need to 
you need to resect at least three pairs of ribs and expose parietal pleura. But results of, uh, of the VCR are really excellent in terms of correction, as you can see here. Coming back to particle subtraction osteotomy, which is a closing osteotomy, but means that you close the wedge defect you performed in the vertebral body. So you close it through the posterior compression, as it was shown by Mehmet, uh, and therefore shorten the posterior column. PCO can be used for correction of cervical kyphosis also, and it was perfectly and uh, excellently discussed and presented by, uh, by Mehmet. Cervical PSO has an alternative referred to as opening wedge osteotomy, and this technique opens osteotomy instead of closing it as in PSO. See this animation. So see the difference between opening wedge and closing wedge osteotomy. And let me now show you how I release fixed kyphotic deformities of the cervical spine in unclosing spondylitis. I modified the classic C7 PSO and called this modification the crosswise osteotomy. So I am not excising the, the, the wedge of bone from the, from, the, from the vertebral C7 vertebral body. And here's an example of so-called chin on chest deformity in the course of ankylosing spondylosis, spondylitis. And chin on chest deformity leads, leads to see loss of forward gaze, problems with oral feeding, and neck hygiene and many other problems. For example, that patient could not visit dentist for many years because of his deformity and problems with adequate opening of his mouth. And let me remind you that loss of forward gaze correlates with decrease in quality of life. So restoration of forward gaze must provide some balance between the upward and downward control of visual field and is aim aimed on gaining correction of chin brow angle between 10 and 20 degrees. If you do 100% correction and patient will have a perfect horizontal gaze, that's for nothing because he will control, he, he will lose control of, of his uh, feet and ground. Uh, see now. A C7 extension crosswise osteotomy may be a suitable alternative to pedicle subtraction osteotomy when correcting forward gaze and chin-on-chest deformity presentations of ankylosing spondylitis. You must the beginning of this procedure is the same as in PSO and includes insertion of pedicle this. screws at three levels above and three levels below C7. Resection of the C7 lamina, the lower edge of C6, and the upper edge of the T1 lamina, C6, C7, and C7, T1 facet joints, and both C7 pedicles. The difference begins here. From this point, the osteotomy continues with a crosswise cut of the C7 vertebral body and with the use of a fine chisel. The interior cortex of the body is precisely resected with a fine kerosene punch. Manual extension of the spine is executed to achieve the calculated amount of correction and is secured by connecting rods to pedicle screws. The anteriorly based wedge gap created with extension will easily fill in with bone as the potential for bony regrowth and healing is extensive in AS. The crosswise cut of the vertebral body following resection of the posterior elements allows opening the osteotomy anteriorly instead of closing it posteriorly as in PSO, which results in shortening of the posterior column and carries some risks which include stretching of the lower cervical nerve roots within the newly formed neuroforamen, buckling dura, and kinking of the spinal cord. In ankylosing spondylitis, the dura is often stiff and when kinked may compress on the spinal cord. In addition, wedge excision, as in PSO, may require aggressive retraction of nerve roots, posing the risk of their injury. Watch how closing the wedge osteotomy may affect the dura, spinal cord, and nerve roots when compared to crosswise extension osteotomy. C7 crosswise extension osteotomy begins with instrumentation of the spine using pedicle screws. It extends three levels below and above the osteotomy site. O-arm navigation and monitoring of motor evoked potentials are used throughout the surgery. Screws are inserted in C4, C5, C6, T1, T2, and T3 pedicles. Navigation provides safety and accuracy of screw placement. 
The osteotomy begins with the resection of the posterior elements of the C6, C7, and T1 vertebrae. The use of navigation allows for topographical orientation in the operating field and anatomy of the spine, which can be distorted in ankylosing spondylitis. C7 laminectomy is performed, followed by C6 to T1 facetectomy, exposing the nerve roots in neuroforamina. The right C7 pedicle is taken down with a high-speed drill. The boundaries of the left C7 pedicle are palpated with a dissector and dural adhesions are detached. The pedicle is taken down with a bone nibbler. After this, a crosswise cut of the C7 vertebral body will begin. The cut is made between the C7 and C8 nerve roots with the use of a fine chisel. Such a cut does not require retraction of nerve roots nor manipulation of them. Wide exposure laterally allows the surgeon to reach the midline of the vertebral body with the chisel from both sides of the spinal cord. The anterior cortex is taken down with a fine kerosene to avoid injury of prevertebral tissues, namely the esophagus. The dissector is used to check to what extent the osteotomy site has been mobilized. Once the osteotomy of the anterior cortex is complete, the surgeon will then cut the posterior cortex. The dissector protects the dura and spinal cord while the microdissector is used to palpate the posterior cortex. It is cut along the midline with the chisel, which must be passed behind the anterior dura from the far lateral direction to avoid cord injury. Here the whole posterior cortex was completely cut with a chisel only. If, however, the remnants of the cortex are left in place, they can be safely broken during extension of the head. Once the osteotomy is complete, rods are inserted into the heads of the thoracic screws and secured with tightening nuts. The operating surgeon extends the head manually while maintaining the hinge of extension of the posterior cortex. He grasps the unlocked Mayfield clamp under the drapes with one hand and the patient's forehead with the other. Once the extension is completed, the head holder system is clamped to secure a new position of the head and the surgeon connects rods to the cervical pedicle screws. A gap in the anteriorly created wedge should fill in with the bone as the potential for bony regrowth is extensive in AS. Um, I hope that all of you could hear uh, um, voiceover. Could you hear the voiceover by the speaker? Yeah, it was it was nice. Yeah, it was everything okay, was good. right. So yes so as you know uh, there was um, a big triangular gap left after after and after uh, this uh, opening wedge osteotomy and uh, the potential of bone of growing of bone in ankylosing spondylitis is so so extensive that this gap filled in with the bone within four months so you can see the results now and uh, this is uh, what uh, this is a um, whole spine radiogram and this is the final result so the patient now can uh, just work at the table and uh, with the laptop with the, the desktop and of course uh, can enjoy the, the, the normal uh, professional life and uh, and during protests are, are ex especially effective uh, at cervical spine because uh, you can you can you can perform destruction of the anterior column with the use of cages or expanded vertebral body prosthesis and destruction force force is applied to the end plate the whole end plate which is a rather big surface and this is powerful correction while from posteriorly you can only uh, produce correction by leveraging uh, screws and see uh, this was achieved only by my um, pen by this uh, deformity in a young uh, lad was achieved only by insertion of, um, uh, of uh, interbody cages and only secured with the plate. And here you can see the results two years later, it's complete fusion. And because the whole curvature was uh, uh, included into the construct, so you can you can't see an adjacent segment disease, neither uh, subjacent nor uh, uh, adjacent uh, upward. And this is another case where correction was also achieved only with the use of inner body cages and again this is this is few years after surgery uh, just just a, a little a little bit loss of correction however in some cases you need to augment the posterior the, uh, anterior construct with the posterior construct so that to avoid uh, adjacent segment uh, pathology like here you could see that this segment could be exposed to the risk of adjacent segment pathology so I had to, despite the excellent correction, I had to go ahead with posterior 
stabilization. And look uh, at that uh, moment uh, that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, look at this uh, because uh, it's very important to leave to the, mo the two most mobile segments of the spinal, of the cervical spine, C0, C1 and C1, C2. If you lose them, the patient will enjoy uh, a movement, a motion of head like in here. Okay, I sorry, I don't have video. So take home message. What are pros of anterior approaches? You can you can apply highly wedged anterior cages that allow for amount of correction which is equal to that provided by the PSO. And anterior correction is much less invasive compared to posterior approaches. So what are cons? Uh, anterior approaches usually have to be combined with posterior approaches, two or even three stage surgery. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. It was a very interesting uh, presentation and very interesting cases, uh, including the modification of the osteotomy. Uh, this was um, something that was worth seeing. Um, again, to, to you, the same question. If you have uh, now we, we are starting to use all these expandable cages, which have good inbuilt uh, angulation. Uh, do you see yourself using this? And if that's the case, do you see yourself using less anterior approaches? Of course, uh, anterior expandable cages are an excellent solution for this. And they were probably invented with uh, this idea in mind. So as I'm for. Okay, uh, how, how often do you need to perform anterior? Let's say uh, my other question to you is, um, you, I can see you routinely do the uh, lateral approaches, uh, but you still do, uh, you still do um, L5S1 uh, in an A-lift fashion, but not only fashion, you yes, still put the patient uh, 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 and with, uh, you know, supine. Uh, would you comment on that? Of course, um, uh, I would say that the majority of low-grade uh, ismic slips uh, I do now in minimally invasive way, but I mean percutaneous, uh, percutaneous screw fixation uh, combined with uh, mini minimally invasive tleaf or a leaf or olive, depending on the patients. If I have an obese patient, I really I'm not very eager to to go ahead with. Uh, anterior approaches, either olive or a leaf. Uh, of course, um, I do a leaf, still a leaf at L5S1, because I believe that this is the most, uh, is much safer than X, uh, X leaf is simply impossible, but X even is safer than olive. I, I know that some can apply and use olive for L5S1, but I, my experience is that there is no better way to perform anterior, anterior uh, interbody fusion for L5S1 than direct direct anterior approach through fun and steel skin incision. And you asked me uh, about what else? Can you remind yeah, me? Yeah, what if you have to do, let's say, L4, L5, and L5S1? Well, if I if it, it if it comes to L4, L5, of course, I'm doing uh, only oblique approach, eventually X leaf because I'm not gonna to play around with uh, big vessels, which are which normally you have to do when uh, attacking L4, L5 uh, interspace through truly anterior approach. So L5S1, also a leaf, L4, L5 and higher olive or x leaf. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's fair enough. And that's a, that's a good approach. I think if there is no other uh, questions, then probably we can um, close that session. Thank you so much for your participation. It was really nice to have you all here and uh, uh, grateful to all um, presenters and grateful to all of the participants in, the, uh, in this webinar. I think um, we can close now and have the rest of the weekend for us and for our families. Yes. Thank you, Nikolai. It was Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you. All the, all Thank the you so much, everybody. Bye. All the best, and uh, hope to see you soon again. Goodbye. Bye bye. Goodbye.